On behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies here at the Joseph Corbell School, and on behalf of the Department of Religious Studies and the Political Theory Forum here at the Corbell School, I'd like to welcome everyone to our final event of the um, winter academic quarter. If you're interested in more uh, information with respect to future events or the activities of our Center for Middle East Studies, we have a website that you can access and um, you can find out more about our coming events and our, and our research initi initiatives. Uh, it's a huge honor to have uh, Ramin Jahanbeglu with us here today. Uh, Ramin Jahanbeglu is a prominent Iranian Canadian philosopher. He received his um, BA, MA, and PhD in philosophy, history, and political science from the uh, Sorbonne University in Paris. He's been a researcher at the French Institute for Iranian Studies and a fellow at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at uh, Harvard University. Ramin has taught at the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. He's been a research fellow at the Center for <laughs> Ethics at the same university. He later served as the head of the Department of Contemporary Studies of the Culture, Cultural Research Center in Tehran. And previously, he was the Rajni Kothari Professor of Democracy at the Center for the Study of Developing uh, Studies in New Delhi, India. And currently, he holds the newer chair in Islamic Studies at the uh, York University in Toronto. And Rami is also the author of several books, um, The Gandhian Moment, um, Talking India, Conversations with Ashish Nandi, Conversations with Isaiah Berlin, Democracy in Iran, and numerous other edited volumes and books of conversation, and most recently, um, Rami is the author of Time Will Say Nothing, A Philosopher Survives an Iranian Prison, uh, recently published in Canada and on sale outside this room um, after the uh, event. Well, they're selling the books right now, but you can purchase it at any time. Um, in October 2009, Rami Jahanbeglu became the winner of the Peace Prize um, from the United Nations Association in Spain for his extensive academic work in promoting dialogue between cultures and his advocacy for nonviolence. Now, that is Rami Jahanbeglu's official uh, biography. Allow me to speak personally for a moment about um, Rami and how I got to know him. Um, our paths coincided approximately 15 years ago when I had just uh, begun my PhD at the University of Toronto and Ramin was a postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of Toronto. And we bonded over our mutual interests in um, political philosophy, intellectual ideas and debates. But more specifically, um, we bonded um, by virtue of our mutual and shared interest with respect to the prospects for democracy and political change inside Iran. Um, at that time, um, the prospects for political change in Iran looked quite um, promising. Um, Iran was undergoing a, um, a Tehran Spring moment as a result of the um, election of a new reformist um, president. And um, Ramin and I had a lot in common with respect to um, um, the, the question of Iran democracy, ideas, debates. And soon afterwards, after completing his postdoc at the University of Toronto, Ramin abandoned a very promising uh, academic career that he had in the West. And he decided to go back to Iran to participate in the struggle for uh, political change, for democracy. And he became actively involved in civil society debates, <coughs> but especially in terms of playing a very unique role as a conduit for bringing um, Western intellectuals, Western academics, to Iran to familiarize them with the realities of Iranian society and politics, meeting like-minded intellectuals and civil society advocates. Um, and he developed quite a reputation. Um, and it's precisely and specifically because of the work that Ramin was doing in Iran at this time um, um, that he um, um, was arrested in 2006, soon after the election of Iran's hardline president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And he was charged with um, being one of the intellectual leaders or theoreticians of um, um, a, a, an attempt to foment um, what was described as a velvet revolution inside Iran. Now, what was interesting about the charge was that um, in the global community, um, a velvet revolution is generally associated with a positive thing. But from the perspective of the Iranian government, that was considered to be a subversive act. And Ramin um, was actually the first in a series of um, intellectuals who had dual passports were arrested, really as a way of sending a message to the rest of Iranian civil society that we can arrest this guy who has a Canadian passport, we can do whatever we want to him, and the world can't say anything. 
Um, and uh, his arrest led to a global campaign to secure his release. And one of the sort of early um, uh, memories that I have with the associate director of our Center for Middle East Studies, Danny Postel, is when we both uh, participated in a radio interview with an Australian uh, radio station around the question of Ramin's release and his unique uh, contributions to Iran. And um, he eventually was released. And if you want to you know, read about that story, the autobiography that I just mentioned that is on sale outside the door provides the full story. And I encourage you to um, um, take a look at it. Eventually, Ramin was released. He made his way back to Canada via India. And um, one of the things I just wanted to say at the outset before I turn to him and and, and and pick his brain on the announced topic, one of the things that immediately impressed me about Ramin is that he had sort of a very unique and distinct set of intellectual interests. Like many people of his generation who sort of left the Middle East, travels to the West um, to study intellectual ideas, um, Rami became fully versed in intellectual ideas and paradigms um, that um, are a byproduct of the Western sort of cultural and historical and political experience. But he chose to sort of focus and specialize his dissertation work on the politics and theory of nonviolence, focusing on the work and the ideas of Mahatma Gandhi. And that, of course, brings us to today's topic. Um, given recent global debates and um, national security concerns um, related to the rise and expansion of militant and extremist Islam, from Charlie Hebdo in Paris to Boko Haram in Nigeria and on to ISIS in Iraq and Syria, we thought that it would be a perfect sort of moment to invite Ramin to the University of Denver um, to share with us his ideas and knowledge about this broad theme of the relationship between violence and nonviolence, specifically within the Islamic tradition, and um, to, um, to share with us this ideas on a question that I think, based on the audience attendance here, is on everyone's mind. And so um, let me turn to Ramin and first say thank you for being here. It's an honor to have thank him you with us. Um, before getting into the question of the announced topic, could you just share with the audience at the outset um, some background information in terms of how you got interested, why did you get interested in the ideas of nonviolence theory and Mahatma Gandhi? This is something that no one coming from Iran or coming from the Middle East really has chosen to specialize on. And so what made your particular journey and interest in this topic unique? How did you get involved? What sparked your interest? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I want to say hello to everyone. And, uh, quite impressed by the number of people who are present here and I hope that we're going to have a good exchange of ideas. Uh, actually, I'm here more for you and to answer your questions. Um, but coming back to my uh, itinerary, intellectual itinerary, um, I think that it would be a, quite a wrong uh, 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 supposition and, and uh, I would think it would be wrong to say that somebody coming from the Middle East or a Muslim background could not be interested in Gandhi. I mean, there's, there's no reason why somebody not coming from the Middle East could not encounter uh, uh, Gandhi or India. On the contrary, because um, uh, coming from Iran, you know, Iranian culture has influenced uh, 400 years of India. Uh, in architecture, art, uh, mysticism, uh, music, uh, even uh, uh, cu cuisine and everything else. So uh, there has always been a very close uh, contact between India and Iran. And uh, that's how I discovered uh, Gandhi, very naturally, through my parents, who were open uh, towards Indian culture. And uh, 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 during the Shah's regime, when uh, I was a kid in Iran, uh, we used to have contacts with the uh, people from the Indian embassy, and we took it very naturally. I mean, listening to uh, Indian Ravi Shankar or uh, reading Tagore uh, came to me uh, very naturally uh, growing up in an intellectual family, an artistic family. So it's, um, but uh, there's a second point to that, and it's when I went to France, and I, sorry, I have my back to you. Um, uh, it's when I went to France and I uh, started uh, getting very much involved in French intellectualism um, and uh, French philosophy that uh, I started working on German idealism but also on, I would say, everything which is uh, mostly, um, as you mentioned, I did my uh, uh, PhD in philosophy but I did uh, uh, my masters and my BAs in history, in political science and philosophy the three disciplines at the same time. 
so I worked, I, 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 I did, and at the age of 23, I, I did my first book on Hegel and French Revolution. And I was very much interested in Hegelian uh, idea of the state. And at the same time, when I was doing my history, while I was writing this book, I was working on Clausewitz and the theory of war, which has nothing to do with non gandhian at all. I mean, it's not a, so. Uh, uh, it, theories of violence brought me to nonviolence because I worked very deeply in theories of violence, political theory of violence, uh, and I was always interested to uh, discover, uh, you know, the the reverse. Uh, if there are any theories of nonviolence, and I started reading Martin Luther King Jr. He's he's one of my heroes also. I started uh, reading Gandhi, and I, uh, I, I, I did my first trip to India while I was a student in, uh, in, in Paris. And I, uh, from that time on, I engaged with the nonviolent groups in France. And uh, at the time, these were the anti-nuclear groups, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time, and I started writing in French about Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and, uh, and many others. So I got involved in, in, in Gandhism and in uh, Gandhi philosophy and finally I decided that I have to write my PhD, my thesis on, on Gandhi, but especially on the Western influences on Gandhi, which is John Ruskin, Henry David Thoreau, and especially Tolstoy, as you know. So I, I mostly wrote about the encounter of Gandhi with those people. So let's now turn to sort of the crux of the matter that I think mm. has brought many people into this room, and that's the question of the relationship yeah. between Islam and violence and the possibilities of, of nonviolent theory. I think it's safe to say that there's a wide-held and deeply felt sort of uh, um, perception or conviction in the West among many people that um, there is something unique about Islam mm -hmm. that lends itself, if you want to be polite, that lends itself more than other religious traditions to a certain politicization of faith, and as a consequence of this alleged unique disposition within Islam that makes it more of a political religion, that then lends itself um, much more easily to justifying acts of violence in the name of religion mm -hmm. in contrast to Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. Do you agree with this claim? No, I don't. <laughs> well, why don't I don't you? agree with you because, uh, first of all, it depends on which Islam we are talking about. I mean, most of the time, I the, one of the first questions that I I, I, I teach two classes on Islam. One is uh, Muslim diaspora in the West and uh, uh, Islam and modernity, and uh, uh, in Canada I, I teach that. But uh, the, one of the first questions I ask my students, which I am going to ask you also, but is. Uh, what are the two first, uh, population-wise, what are the two first in the Muslim societies uh, or countries in the world? And most of the time, people think that Islam and the Middle East go hand in hand, or Islam and the Arab world go hand in hand. In hand. As you know, the two first ones are Indonesia and India, which are both in Asia outside the Middle East, and they are non-Arab, and they are non-Iranian, and uh, so and non-Turk. So. Uh, uh, the, the interesting point is that when people approach uh, uh, Islam, it's in a very uh, stereotypical way. Um, and this is very unfortunate because, uh, first of all, we have had Christianity being uh, very much uh, you know, uh, uh, connected to violence. We had the Inquisition. But we have had in 20th century, actually, uh, Christianity being also, or Christians being uh, also, in Latin America especially, or in the Hispanic world, being connected to, uh, to, to violence. In the same way, we had the zealots with the, with the Jews, you know, in, in ancient times. And it's not necessarily that it was only the Muslims who knew about violence. I mean, you open your Bible, you see a lot of... Uh, Episodes that you have violence in it, and uh, it's uh, so. And many Jewish philosophers have written on that. Levinas being one of them, actually, who was one of my professors. He his theories of nonviolence actually. Emmanuel Levinas, uh, you're asking him. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Uh, he was he's one of the main thinkers of alterity, in, and he is now having a lot of influence in North America. Well, he 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 talks about violence actually. In, also in, in the Bible or in Judaism. So it's not only about Islam, 
It's, it's about Muslims and it's about the management of Muslim countries. I think we have to distinguish between, and which Muslim country are we talking about? Are we talking about Muslims in India? Are we talking about the public sphere in Indonesia? Are we talking about Malaysia? Are we talking about Iran, Turkey, or one Arab country? And again, in Arab countries, are you talking about the uh, North African countries where I lived in? Actually, I lived in Algeria, I've traveled to Morocco, Tunisia, no comparison, point of comparison with a country like Iran, not even in their ritual Islam, not in their perception of Islam. Uh, many, many distinctions to make. So it doesn't come naturally to talk about Islam and violence. I think we have to talk about violent management of Islamic societies in today's world. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that, <laughs> for example, uh, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, these are ways of political management of either countries or groups or uh, human lives. Uh, and this approach is a very ideological approach. It's not just that they are Muslims, they are also very ideological. They have a very ideological approach of not only religion in, and not only Islam, not only religion, but culture and human culture in general. Uh, I, I was talking with Danny Postel actually a few minutes ago about that. Uh, when you go and you destroy human heritage, you don't do that necessarily only in the, in the terms of meaning the Nimrud or the museums or the Buddhas in Bamiyan in Afghanistan. It's not that you are you do that from coming from a Muslim or Islamic background. It's that you don't have any sense of human culture. You don't have any sense of human solidarity. Uh, and I give example, counter examples. <clears throat> Goethe, he had an, a, a sense of human solidarity when he talked about Welt Literatur, which means world literature, and he talked about office, uh, a, a, a Persian poet, being part of this world literature. Uh, you have a sense of uh, human empathy when you uh, are a Gandhi and you work with Muslims, but at the same time you know how to work with Sikhs and Christians, you know, because uh, Gandhi is the most Christian Christian that I've ever, uh, Hindu that I've ever uh, met, you know, and he said it himself because he's he, actually he says I'm the closest to the message of Jesus Christ uh, more than uh, people who use Jesus Christ for colonialism and imperialism, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ going or in the name of Jesus Christ uh, 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 preparing the Inquisition. So this is all about management. It's about how you create a society, how you create your institutions, how you develop this and promote these institutions, but how, what is your consciousness about these institutions and about your action? I, I think that, to make it short, I think uh, we most of the time talk about believing and not believing. Are, we, are you a believer or a non-believer? But we never say what do we do with our beliefs. What comes to my mind is what do we do with our beliefs as Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs? What do we do? Are, uh, is it in the, do we take uh, our beliefs in the, in, in, in the sense of human solidarity in making things better, non-violence, good management, good governance, giving a future to a country? I think uh, the heritage of somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. in this country is that he knew how to take his belief and take it against uh, discrimination, segregation, make something great out of America, uh, which I think without people like Martin Luther, Luther King Jr. would ha not have been done. So then why don't we hear more about nonviolent movements within Muslim societies? Do they exist, and if so, where? First of all, I'd like to answer the, uh, the, the, the bigger question, which is the topic of the, you know, our, our meeting. Is a Mo are there any Muslim Gandhis? They used to be Muslim Gandhis. I mean, there, there are Muslims who work with Gandhi, and Gandhi himself, he says, I learned from Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who is a friend, we call him the frontier Gandhi, actually. I think you need to say at some point more about who Ghaffar Khan was. Yes, I, I would, he's generally unknown. We're going to talk about, you want to say it right now? No, no, we're no talking finish to your point. But, I mean, so Muslim <laughs> Gandhis existed. Uh, Gandhi himself acknowledged the fact that you can meet Muslims who are nonviolent, and but oh, are, how do they become nonviolent? I mean, I don't believe in in a democratic DNA and nonviolent DNA. That's nonsense. 
You cannot say that we have a race uh, in one part of the world that they know about nonviolence or democracy, and we have races or countries or regions that they don't know anything about democracy. It's about everyday life. Democracy is about the institution of the society. It's about lawmaking. It's about peacemaking. It's about everyday effort that we put in uh, human solidarity. So that is something we educate our children of. This, this is a part of it. Violence, the difference between violence and aggression is that as Eric Strom and others, Conor Lawrence have written on it in the 1970s, aggression is, comes from our instincts. It's natural. We, can, we all get angry, okay? We all might become very angry in our private lives. We might become aggressive. But we teach our children how to become violent. We teach them how to manage violence. We teach them how to use guns. We teach them how to kill other people. And we teach them how to be soldiers and go and kill other people in other countries, you know? But if we can teach them violence, we can also teach them nonviolence. So it's very important. Uh, Okay, well, th this brings us back to the question of Islam and Islamic tradition, mm. um, which is um, a hot topic these days. Mm. And uh, the question really boils down to this. What are the intellectual, religious, and cultural resources within Islam, within Islamic history, theology, that can be utilized to um, teach children nonviolence? Well, one of the examples of nonviolent Islam is the Andalusian Islam, which uh, I go to Cordoba every year in the summer. I teach there, and uh, I've uh, I've been in touch with this convivencia actually coexistence at the time of the Umayyads in the 9th, 10th century A.D., where I actually uh, Muslims and Jews and Christians they used to live next to each other, and you had uh, philosophers like Averroes and uh, Maimonides which actually influenced the Renaissance later on. And as you know, my money has influenced Spinoza, a philosopher, philosopher like Spinoza. This is a good example of is nonviolent Islam, or let's say the taming of violence, okay? If, even if we cannot produce uh, characters, figures like, uh, historical figures like Mahatma Gandhi, because I think that people like Mahatma Gandhi and Buddha, we get them every thousand years or 10,000 years. It's not easy to be a Buddha or a Gandhi, okay? We know we are human beings and we know our weaknesses and uh, uh, errors. But we know about how we can manage, non, again, non, non -violent, in a non-violent way our society. So in, I think in Islam, we have had either individual efforts like mystics, uh, Iranian mystics, Sufis, uh, Indian Sufis, which is a completely individual effort uh, to manage violence and tame violence. But we have had forms of like Andalusian Islam or efforts in India, like those who worked with Gandhi, that is, okay, instead of uh, bringing a very fixed idea of Sharia, which is the positive law, or jurisprudence, instead of that, we try to somehow harmonize with the ideas of somebody like Gandhi as uh, Morana Azad and others did. For example, can I yeah. say something, something about that? Yeah. Uh, Morana Azad, who became the first minister of education of Nehru after 1947, he's uh, one of the nonviolent Muslims who worked with Gandhi, and he's coming from a fundamentalist background. And uh, when he was a younger uh, person, before he met Gandhi, he actually he was very fundamentalist. He believed that Islam is the only answer to every question. But in the long run, when he became the president of the Congress Party, the Indian Congress Party, and he started working with he became secular. He believed that India is supposed to has to become a secular country. But he, he continued to be a believer, a, a, a complete believer in Islam, but he, and he separated, he distinguished between what he called deen and sharia. He said, we believe in civil religion, we believe in the equality of religions, but we necessarily, we don't believe in a sharia, which, is our, uh, which change from people to people, from uh, nation to nation, from time to time. We have to think of how we can bring closer religions and how we can have a kind of a 
solid ground, in, which is actually the constitution of India, where different religions can cooperate together, and the result is that they all participate in making the Indian constitution, which is a secular constitution, but at the same time, you don't have exit of religion and religious people from the public sphere because the president can be a Hindu or a Muslim, and the prime minister can be a Sikh or a Hindu or somebody else. Okay, well, that raises you know, the question, why didn't ideas such as the ones that you mentioned from figures such as Maulana Azad or um, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, the frontier Gandhi, why did those sort of non-violent ideas not spread and disseminate and affect the hearts and minds of Muslims while ideas that were much more radical coming out of the you know, Islamist movements in the case of South Asia, you know, um, uh, Maulana Maududi and, yeah. and the Jamaat, why did those take off and, and generate widespread support in contrast to the more nonviolent sort of interpretations of I think Islam. this is what you teach and what I teach. Uh, Islamism is the consequence of modernization of the Middle East and the Arab world and Iran. Typically, the revivalism which starts with Al-Afghani is an answer to modernity. Uh, Al-Banna, which is the uh, leader, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, and after that you have said Qutub in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, actually is an answer to modernization, to modernity, to Western modernity, because they want, and it's, it's an answer, it, they try to find an answer to colonialism and imperialism. That's, if, if we didn't have colonialism, we did, wouldn't have uh, Islamism and fund, fundamentalist Islam in the Middle East. Now, you might come to me and say, well, Gandhi was an anti-colonialist also in India, and why he is non-violent, and we have Sayyid Qutb in Egypt, or we have Al-Banna, or we have Al-Afghani in Iran, or Afghanistan, or, and, uh, and later on Madhud in Pakistan. I think because uh, colonialism uh, was much more, especially, let's say, French colonialism, for example, in Algeria, was very violent. You know, one million Algerians died in wars. I, when I went in Algeria, uh, it was actually a country which not yet is Arabized. Many people uh, were killed and people were talking. My, my father was an economist. He used to work with the Sonatrach. And we were very close to uh, many people. Uh, I talk about it in my memoirs. And so I was surprised that so many people talk French and not Arabic. Uh, so it was very violent. I think that Islamism, and it continues to be. I mean, ISIS, I was talking to an Iraqi. ISIS or ISIL, as you like to call it, um, is the result of the invasion of Iraq, is the result of, the, uh, of what happened in Syria, is the result of this is kind of a nihilistic, I would say, uh, uh, death of culture. You know, uh, my point is, in which I wrote in one of my articles, and I invite you to challenge me on that, death of culture brings the culture of death. Death of culture, when our cultures as human beings die, we, we believe in dying ourselves, and we believe in martyrdom, and we believe in killing. Because we are no more, because cultures actually are points which link us together. When we, read, when we read a poem, a poetry, even by Dylan Thomas, who I like very much, or W.H. Auden, who gave the title to my book, Time Will Say Nothing, uh, or Hafez, or Saadi, or Rumi, uh, when we read a poem, we're still part of the human race. If we don't believe in poems, if we don't believe in arts, if we don't believe in painting, we can destroy them very easily. If we don't believe that Beethoven goes beyond Nazism, and and Wagner goes beyond Nazism, and it's not because stupid Nazis, they listen to uh, you know, Bach or, uh, and, uh, or Wagner, and we want, and uh, we, uh, we have, we will never uh, listen to it again. We, this is the end of our culture. Now, in the case of Islamic fundamentalism, it's because it has become so violent because they are unlike what happened in India and Gandhi gave to them, there is, there is no cultural hope to which you can grab. Iran is an exception, I always say that, because it has a very vibrant and full of strong civil societies where people like myself, they think about their future of their society, but they are also creators. As women's rights movement, they are creators. Look at the number of women in Iran who are poets, film directors, Nobel Peace Prize winners, all, all sorts, novelists, you know? 
because they are creators. When you have creators in a society, you have a future for this society. <laughs> if you don't have a future, you create ISIS. Okay, perfect segue to my final question before I turn it over to the audience. Uh, you've written that the struggle for democracy in Iran today, yeah. embodied in the Green Movement of you know five <laughs> years ago, but the, the contemporary demand for political change um, and the quest for democracy is fundamentally informed by a non-violent strategy of political change. Yes. Gandhian sort of impulses. Since Iran is very I much call it the Gandhian moment. The Gandhian moment. Yes. Since Iran is very much in the news today, although not with respect to its internal democratic sort of struggles, but with respect to the nuclear question. I think the audience would benefit from saying something about the internal struggle for democracy in Iran today, specifically the nonviolent Gandhian moment or Gandhian impulses that inform it. Yeah, I mean, the, the struggle, uh, in the internal struggle in Iran has not only been political and social, it has also been cultural. I mean, again, I go back to the fact that we're not only talking about people inside the Iranian system who are reformists and talk, uh, fighting against Iranian hawks. We're talking about a huge Iranian civil society because Iran is a very young country, uh, one of the youngest actually in the Middle East and one of the youngest in the world with a lot of educated young people who when they do not leave Iran by a huge brain drain and come to America and work for the NASA or work for uh, you know research labs here in, or in Canada, they stay in Iran and they, they try to change the society. But how do they try to change it? They do not do it through fundamentalism. Ask yourself the question, if Iran is a Muslim country, why Iran does not produce Taliban, ISIS, and Al-Qaeda? Has never produced. Iran has not produced one terrorist, you know, in, the, in all the attacks. Well, that well they were sponsored to be produced Ahmadinejad. Yeah, <laughs> Ahmadinejad, but Ahmadinejad is actually part of the regime. It's like, if it's like you replace Brezhnev by Andropov, you know, before Gorbachev. It's society. Yeah, it's about, it's about a nomenclature. I mean, uh, we, uh, maybe Iranian civil society has not had the power to change the Iranian nomenclature, but it has had the power to influence it. Khatami is the, the consequence of the influence of the civil Iranians. Rouhani, I think, is the, influ uh, the consequence of the influence. So, I think on the nuclear deal that you were asking me, I think that not only is it hopeful for the future of the Middle East, because Iran can participate and not only as a state, but as a society in the peacemaking, the future peacemaking of the Middle East in the long run. Uh, and on this, I'm, I think that we, you have to know that uh, young Israelis and young Iranians, they actually fight for the same culture. There have always been allies, actually, natural allies in that, you know, because they believe in peacemaking. But also because I was telling Danny Postel, I mean, Iran is a sacred soil for the Jews, you know. And we have Esther and Daniel there, I mean, uh, biblical figures. Uh, you don't go and bomb biblical figures. I mean, I, I, that's the death of culture. If you don't believe in your own culture and you only believe in being re-elected in an election in Israel and that's the only problem that you have and not only defending your own culture and your own religion, that's why uh, lunacy takes us to uh, this kind of things. But if on the contrary, if we have the possibility of engaging in dialogue, which I try to do as an Iranian and younger Iranians do and young Iranian civil society does with all these problems, with all the difficulties, I think that we will have these alternatives which help us to create a better future for the Middle East. Good. On that note, let's turn the floor over to the audience. Uh, Ved Nanda has his hand jettisoning in the air. First question to Ved. How uh, refreshing to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. As you know, today uh, there is a consensus that uh, ISIS cannot be defeated <coughs> simply by military forces that the United States and all these countries have. If you had your brothers to tell Obama how to defeat them, because the feeling is that it's the marketplace of ideas. They've got an idea, and that idea has taken over today many parts of the Islamic world. What should Obama, what should the United States be doing in order to defeat them, not simply militarily? 
This is a very good question. I would say that, um, and, and this is actually a, a, a proposal that I suggested to uh, Canadians in uh, de-radicalization of uh, young Muslims in Canada, because I think the battle against ISIS starts in America and starts in European countries. It's not, it doesn't start there. I tell you why, because I have students who are sympathetic in Canada, at York University, who are sympathetic to ISIS, just because, and they are born in Canada, and they are from second and third generation of migrants. And uh, we have one student from York University with a Somali background who went to Syria and got killed there. So I, we have to ask questions, you know, if we just take it for granted, we cannot solve the issue. But if we ask questions and we say, why do a young uh, French or young Quebecois or young American, he finds himself or herself frustrated by, uh, uh, by the fact of being just a migrant or second or third generation of migrant, not well integrated, but I would say not well associated, because we always talk about integration, but not about association. People, when they go, uh, to other countries and they live there or they get born there. They have to find an association and not just what the French ask them, you have to be integrated, meaning you have to drink wine and know about camembert, cheese, <laughs> or about his, his, okay, that's fine. I did that also myself. I know very well about French culture and li I like French culture. But at the same time, you need to be associated institutionally. You need to think that you are part of the politics of that country. That you, if you're a Hispanic, you can have a governor at one point. In, in, and, or you will have, you can become a president or a prime minister in one of these countries, okay? Or you will become a minister. And so you are associated with that. Now, there is a sense of frustration to go very quickly because I want to answer all the questions. And this sense of frustration, ISIS works on it. We, have, we know about uh, that. And we know that who are the ones who have been working on it. I actually, if uh, we were talking with Danny Posse about the Atl article Atlantic Monthly, it refers to many people who have been uh, approaching these young uh, uh, second generation or third generation migrants. They are Australian and British. And they are from white backgrounds. They are not Muslim, they, they are converted Muslims actually. So it's very strange, you know? Not somebody like me actually, but I mean, it's very strange. So the battle starts here, and the battle, I would say, is mainly cultural uh, next to the ba political battle. Okay, um, one and then two. Go ahead. <clears throat> Um, let's imagine an Islamic fundamentalist scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being uh, relegated to ISIS. Where would you place Iran on the scale of 1 to 10? Uh, well, I don't like to quantify things, but <laughs> nevertheless, since you are, that's why I don't never give multiple choice to my students, because it makes them even more ignorant. You know? uh, uh, but uh, if uh, if I if I if we have to give ten to ISIS, I will certainly give uh, less than five to Iran. Less than five, I would say, I will give to Iran, because Iran is the hope of. The, I, it's not because I'm I have an Iranian background that I say that because I am trying to be and I tell my American and Canadian friends all the time. It's because I want to be realistic and pragmatic, unlike what the Washington Institute and the American Enterprise Institute they pretend to be. It's because I want to be pragmatic. Peace is pragmatism. Peace, nonviolence is about is not about idea idealism. It's about pragmatism. If we don't want to, if we want to live like we are doing it very civilized in a very civilized way right now, if we want to live together and hang out together and talk to each other, we need to have peace and we have to tame our violences. You know, if I had a gun next to me, you would not ask the question. I mean, I three quarters will leave this room. So. Uh, it's difficult to, to talk with people who have guns on each side. Um, uh, so I think that uh, Iran could be uh, under five, I would say. Thank you. Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I think I agree with most of what you said. And uh, As a Muslim, I would say I totally agree that there is no one Islam, as you said, exactly. And this is uh, our American friends and maybe Western people should really understand that we have like 10 or 12 dif different versions of Islam. But what I maybe I need you to elaborate more is what Nader raised earlier is this political idea of Islam. As a Muslim, I was raised that Islam is not only a faith, 
but also there is a state behind it. And as a Muslim, you're true as at least my version of Islam. And of course, I'm coming to revise this all the time. But before, when I was just a little kid, this is how I got Islam. Because Islam is not only a face, it's not only that you pray five times, but also there is a state should be created. And this state should be run in a way, I mean, Islamic way, whether in economy and societal positions and in politics, etc. And that's why some people, and, and this is, I need you to, to answer, some people really believe it that this is our holy sacred mission we have to create this state mm -hmm. and if we have some problems to create this state we have some times to use violence it's not because of us it's because of god or allah or, yes. i mean so i think this is also part of the problem uh, and and i totally agree with uh, the rest of what he said. yes but you say some people not all yeah, people sure. because i would uh, refer to uh quietest shiites like sistani and others who do not believe that Islam is political and they believe in the separation of Islam and politics. You know Khomeini actually is a, a very marginal uh, figure in quietist Shiism and that's why for a long period of time he did not talk against the Shah of Iran until 1963 because his gurus and his professors like Guru Jerdi and I, I don't need to name them because most of you don't may know them. They uh, actually uh, were quietists and they didn't want to get involved into politics. Now, you in Iraq today, in Afghanistan, in Iran, you have many who are, do not believe in this uh, Mahdi, you know, idea like Ahmadinejad believed in, in uh, everywhere he went, like the United Nations, he, Mahdi was there somewhere, you know. They, they, yeah, because they don't believe in that and they believe that Islam should be quietest and we have to go but I mean you can find this political intervention in religion at different periods of history even in Christianity or in Hinduism today Hindutva or when we Americans or North Americans let's say when we, we think of Hinduism immediately for us Hinduism would be Krishna Hare Krishna Gandhi and we think, okay, these are pacifists, so such nice people, they're gonna go around and say Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. But Modi actually comes with BJP, the today's prime minister, and he, in his coalition, he has the RSS, who, when I was in India in December, wanted to build a temple of the person who assassinated Gotse, who assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. They bring politics into their Hinduism, okay? So it's not, we should not generalize. We should have a knowledge of the thing. Yeah, but the, just to push this point a bit further, the question is that many Muslims, not all Muslims, are, receive this message that Ahmed sort of talks about, that you have a moral obligation as a Muslim, not simply to practice the rituals, but to try and create in society a quote-unquote Islamic polity or state. And that means if someone is preventing you from doing that, then you have a moral and Islamic theological obligation to pressure that government violently, if necessary, to bring about a more religious or Islamic milieu. That's a message that is sort of increasingly, over the last um, several decades, a message that's been heard by a lot of Muslims, granted mostly in the Arab world. It's not really an Indonesian issue. It's not an Indian issue. Um, uh, but it's very much part of the reality, at least of the Arab world today. Yeah, it has been formulated differently by different Islamists. Uh, for example, as you know, uh, Sayyid Qutb talks about Hakimiya uh, against uh, Jahidiya. Uh, but Hakimiya means sovereignty, you know. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, when, they, when many Muslims, they say, well, our motto is the time of the Prophet. At the time of the Prophet, you didn't have state. I mean, we're not talking about the modern state because when Europeans and our North Americans talk about the state, they, they, for them, is we're talking about the modern state, mm -hmm. Hobbesian, Rousseauist, Lockean state. Mm -hmm. In Islam, there is no formulation of this kind of, uh, you know, modern theory, political theory. So it's mostly about, you know, do you disagree with me? Yeah. yeah? We don't have this. I mean, but Sayyid Qutb, when he spoke about Hakimiya. Yes, but Sayyid Qutb is an ideologue of 20th century. But when ISIS says, I want to build my caliphate, he says, my model is the time of the prophet, okay? So there is a paradox here. I say, if theoretically there's a paradox and we don't pay attention to this paradox that, what the hell are you talking about? What well, you're talking about making what kind of a state? And that's, that was not a state. I mean, you, even if you talk about the city state like the Athenians or the Greeks used to say, it's not a modern state. So how do you want to manage things? Uh, you want to have, 
the same model that was at the time of the Prophet, but you want to have a globalized economy. So they, these people have all the Islamists around the globe. They are full of paradoxes, and we have to pay attention at these paradoxes. Okay. Micheline? I, I would like to submit that the Gandhian moment, uh, sorry, I didn't read the book, so. <laughs> might have been lost during the Arab uprising. There were the initial phase of the Arab uprising, you had many people who actually rallied in various squares, including Egypt, who were sort of Gandhian in uh, their posture. Uh, but soon enough, we know that military with its Tunisia and Egypt and elsewhere sort of just start uh, shooting in the crowds, and that moment, that Gandhian moment, changed, Syria and elsewhere. And so the question is, particularly going back to some of the points that you made, if you were to sustain the Gandhian moment, how would that look like? I, I know that you, in your critical position, you said that the, the sort of problem of management, but I, I still have to understand um, how, did, how should have, if they were ever able, the Muslim Brotherhood develop a political economy that made sense for uh, the regime of Egypt post-revolution? How, how would they have done it differently? How would they have drawn on a different form of Islam in order to do, make it happen? I don't see that you can find that particular level of ammunition in order to precisely do what you're interested in, is the sustainability of those Gandhian moments, the manageability of those Islamic regimes, if you could address uh, My understanding of the concept of moment is not the same understanding as yours. I would use it as a Bergsonian duration. When I talk about the moment, Gandhi moment is a potentiality. Potentiality is uh, something which is continuous in time. So, for example, I, I'm going to give you a, a, an American example. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. created a potentiality with his nonviolent movement which did not only end with the civil rights movement and the civil rights and the fact that you have a black president finally in America, but it is a potentiality which can be used in Ferguson. It's a potentiality which could be used against a racist, you know, a policeman who shoot on blacks around America. This is a potentiality. Why? People can come back with the same message and say, we want to use this nonviolence in today's America and we want to tame the violence that we have, either in this racist form or non-racist forms. Non-racist forms is when we give guns to children and they go and kill people in, at schools, okay? This is also a taming of violence and this is also when it becomes, the Gandhi moment becomes a potentiality. So the Gandhi moment in the Middle East is a potentiality also, which is still there, especially in Iran, but is still there in Tunisia, Morocco, and elsewhere, everywhere where we go back to this message, uh, or we go back to this civic strategy. It's not only a message, it's not only a spiritual message, it's how we organize ourselves. Do we organize ourselves with guns or in a violent way? Do we believe in uh, organizing ourselves or fighting against let's say, uh, a danger like ISIS in a by invasion, military invasion, by new form of violence, or we try to fight against it in, a, in different nonviolent ways, uh, uh, through nonviolent conflicts, you know? So I think the potentiality is something which has to ring in our ears. Uh, question at the back, yeah. You spoke before about the need for people, the folks who are getting attracted to ISIS ideology here in the West have association with us in the West. Do <coughs> you have any concrete either policy ideas for government or sort of cultural behavioral ideas for those of us not in government and how to build that kind of association? Yes, this is a very good question actually. I think what uh, today we call de-radicalization uh, de-radicalization is not to go and uh, find people who are might get converted to ISIS and put them in jail. Actually, is to educate them. But how do you educate them? And how do what kind of education you bring to Muslim quarters, Muslim ghettos, Muslim young Muslims in North America and in Europe? Uh, you provide them with possibilities, you provide them with uh, capacities, you teach them. I propose to teach them about nonviolent Islam. They don't know anything about it. They think that well, uh, Islam is about statehood, or Islam is about fundamentalism, or Islam is about killing, or Islam is only about going to the mosque. Well, you tell them, but well, Islam is a civilization. You come from a background, a civilizational background, it is your responsibility and it is your moral responsibility to know about your civilizational background as an Indian, Pakistani, Iranian, Turk, 
um, uh, Moroccan, Egyptian. It, you have to know about that. It's not just that you hear the Azan or the prayer, prayer and you go and you pray with others. This is not the only Islam. As Christianity is not the, uh, only about going to the church, you know? It's a whole civilizational act. Actually, I think if we truncate, if we trun if, if in the three pillars of each civilization is art, philosophy, and religion. You cut that, we are lost. And it's the way we actually, many empires, the downfall of many empires, and, and this is how uh, actually uh, Aztecs and Mayas and others disappeared. You know, it's not just because they were invaded, it's because they were subjected also metaphysically, philosophically, ontologically, you know, in front of something which we call the modern times. So it's, I think we have to do this cultural work policy oriented, okay, with policy consequences. But we have to do it, we, you know, we have to understand that military solutions are the last solutions. Okay, Jen. Help us with our own culture here. Um, as, as the Enlightenment moves into the progressive liberal tradition of today, we also develop a strong secularism, meaning that we privatize religion, very John Locke even. Um, our, the evangelical foundationalists are quite offended by that because they say that religion is now the religious including the evangelical atheists or second-class citizens. I think it's Neil Feldman uh, writes a book about weak secularism. Yeah. Can you speak anything to how we can integrate the religious, the Muslims, the evangelical atheists, the, the mainline Protestants, the Catholics, in, back into a progressive liberal society, which has a very strong wall of secularism in principle. Well, I think that one of our errors, uh, philosophical errors, is actually to not distinguish between religion and spirituality. You know, we never distinguish between the two. Actually, the, the, the thinkers I were talking about, uh, I was talking about, like Gandhi and others, they distinguish between the two because most of the time, like Tulsa and Gandhi, they're against what they call organized religion. But they are they have nothing against religion and spirituality. Because we know that religion is ethics, theology, and jurisprudence, practically all religions, you know? But if you have only a, an ethical take on, on religion, you're a religious person, but you have only an ethical take and not a theological take or a, a judicial take. That's very important. So we need more and more people to have ethical takes on religion and to somehow, like the Indians did it at some point, to believe in secularism but not in an aggressive uh, secularism like we have it in France and with or Kemalism in Turkey, which means if you're religious, you have to get out of the public sphere and public sphere is going to be managed only by seculars. Mm -hmm. No, it could be uh, managed by people like Mulana Azad who believe in Indian secularism but they believe that religious people can come and manage it also. You know, they can become presidents and prime ministers as spiritual people. They might go to their temples, but they don't intervene, you know, their religious ideas in the making of politics in their countries or in the international relations. This is two different approaches. I don't think that the message that we get from the Enlightenment should be necessarily an absolutist message. It could be the pluralist message of the Enlightenment, which I believe in. Mm -hmm. Because there are many forms of Enlightenment also, and it depends on which approach you have to the Enlightenment. For example, I talk for a new Enlightenment in Iran, but I choose my thinkers, you know? And I did a book with Isaiah Berlin, who actually formulated the idea of counter-Enlightenment, while he himself He's a typical personality of the uh, Enlightenment, and he was actually an agnostic all his life as a Jew. You know, that's very important. He believed in the state of Israel, but he was an agnostic. He never intervened God as a British uh, in any of his work. And I think that it would be it would be good to do that at the same time in other religions. Okay, take two two more questions, and then we'll have to end it. One, and then two. Okay. And then, th well, three, make it three. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so as a young Muslim, um, just my family's from Libya, so definitely Arab, um, I was actually raised with this understanding that in my position, in my society, I have really strong beliefs in Islam and how peaceful it is and how 
um, when you live about when you act your life, you're not going toward the state. In reality, it's not like that belief. It's toward. It's more similar to the belief that when you're acting and when you look at yourself in, um, in all your aspects. So yeah, you pray five times a day. Yes, you fast. Yes, you do all of these things. In the end, if society happens to move toward a more Muslim-based thing, awesome. But you're not actively, physically, violently doing that. So my question to you is: When I look at um, ISIS, when I look at this debate that's going around everywhere in the world, I get so frustrated with the fact that people believe that Islam is violent, and I get so upset that I have to always justify my religion and justify what I believe. But what would you say to, for as a person who looks at ISIS and spits on what they, their actual practices and all the killing that they do and everything, that all the negative connotations are coming back to Islam, what should I do domestically and to other Arabs who are also passionate to, I guess, combat it and to really show our passion and show what we are and what we believe and not let other people tell our story for us? Well, uh, I would say that uh, if you want to be compassionate, you should not spit even on ISIS, I would say. <laughs> the act of spitting is an uh, act of uh, misperception and misunderstanding, I would say, because uh, the best way to fight even fundamentalism in any religion is first to understand why people become fundamentalists. Because they are human beings like us. And we all have these weaknesses. And we all know that we can become very violent, okay? It, and we have to re-educate ourselves with nonviolence. But as Gandhi did with India, as Martin Luther King Jr. did with America. So it's very important to understand that how we, but I believe in in dialogue, and I believe in dialogical action. What do, what do I mean by that? I believe that in every culture you have elements that you can take out and you can work with it, okay? For example, since I'm in America, if I have to take elements from American culture, I will certainly not take Michael Jordan, but I will take Emerson. Uh, I will not, yeah, I will not take G.W. Bush, but I will take Henry David Thoreau. I will take Martin Luther King Jr. And I would use that for Middle East, and I would use that for Iran. The same way for with China, with Japan, and with uh, India, and Iran, and uh, Israel, and many others. You know, uh, le starting reading about them, starting uh, having contacts with them, understanding them, and I would say making, trying to make a new world, uh, trying to make, uh, a, 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 I would say, alternative global world, which would be in the long run a peacemaking world. You're next. I've, I've been sitting here trying to listen since you made the Trying to Trying to listen. Yeah. <laughs> and that's part of the issue. You know, we come from different places, we have different cultures, we have different beliefs. You know, listening, as I think you pointed out a minute ago, is, is, a, is a terribly difficult thing. Yes. So, I want to apologize for trying to listen. <laughs> um, since you made the statement that Iran does not produce terrorists. Mm. And I'm sitting here saying Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, the challenge that Netanyahu made, uh, in spite of the little put down, um, that, that if Iran wants to be wants to be an international player, why don't they start acting like a responsible nation? Help me bridge that gap a little bit. Because my beliefs are about the facts seem to be different than your beliefs about the fact. Yeah, I think the confusion here is with respect to your references to Iran, which were more about the eternal Iranian society yes, exactly. and its potential versus the ruling oligarchy in power in Tehran. So I, I didn't say that Iran doesn't produce terrorists, you know. Uh, even Iran, Iran could produce terrorists, but it, Iranian civil society doesn't produce terrorists. And I'm talking about when we, uh, you know, the image that we have in America of a country like Iran, which uh, somebody like Mr. Netanyahu bets on, is the image of the gov Iranian government. It's not the image of the Iranian society. So can we talk about the country without its population? Just uh, putting into parenthesis its population and its younger population and its civil society? No, it's not the case. Do I will go and ask the question from Mr. Netanyahu and say, you're Israeli, I would say, do you talk only about your government and your party or you're talking in the name of Israelis? Okay? Because I read some Israelis, you know, and I don't get the impression that they are pro-Netanyahu, you know, 
Uh, and I have friends like Shlomo Avineri, with whom I've done many things, uh, the books and the articles and other things, and I don't get the impression from Shlomo Avineri that he is in this direction of thought, or many others, many other Israelis who I know. So, what's the point? I think that in, even in the art of listening, I think there is an art of understanding also, you know, because it's not only about sitting down and listening, it's also about empathy and understanding, Einfühlung, what they heard it called Einfühlung. Einfühlung is when you approach another culture and you just don't read it like that, as you're reading a book for your daughter of four years old uh, 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 before sleeping, but also you get a point out of it, you know. That's why I mentioned that literature of Goethe and, and Hafez. He gets a point out of it. He said, oh, how close I feel myself with this poet who's a Muslim poet who's living in Iran uh, at this age. And maybe there are points of comparison and I can take something out of that. So that's what I, the point that I'm making. I say, if we look at these societies with an open mind, but also engage in a dialogue, let's go and have a coffee with an Iranian, sit down and ask this Iranian, what do you think about Mr. Netanyahu? What do you think about the future of Iran? What do you think about Islam? And next day I go out with a Libyan and I ask her about where do you come from? What is your background? But if I have stereotypes and I put all of them in the same jar, I will not get the jam I like. So you have been in prison, many other journalists, writers, activists have been in prison in Iran. I totally agree with the nonviolent movement, but I also feel it's very hard when you are in a prison cell. How do you think about that and how do you feel that immediate gap of how do I talk to my interrogators? How do I think about the people who are torturing me? And how do you move from that personal moment to the more general movement? Well, you have to read my book about that. But, I, uh, <laughs> but that, I mean, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's no honor in suffering. You know, if, uh, if we had to, because once again, you cannot quantify suffering. We cannot say that a Jew who has uh, suffered in a, a Holocaust in a concentration camp like Auschwitz, I visited Auschwitz twice, uh, has suffered more than somebody who goes, you know, we have different forms of suffering, we have different forms of making people suffer at different ages, different centuries, like Inquisition and others. Uh, so I don't take an honor in that, but I think that the point which I got from my suffering or from, my, from prison is that if they are practicing violence on me, I don't want to become, I, I don't want to get at the same level morally, you know? Because how can I, how can I banish, how can I criticize the cruelty coming or violence from somebody else if I use the same form of violence or even worse? For example, I say, uh, I believe in death penalty, I believe in destroying these people. I, I should formulate some new forms of you know, human compassion, but also new forms of human understanding. Because violence is about non-understanding of humans, non-understanding. And here I'm not preaching to you, because I'm not a preacher. I'm talking to you as a human being, as somebody who went through this experience, but also as a philosopher who has been trying to reflect on these things. I, in my book I mention, and I close that, I think philosophy has a civic task, okay? Civic, civ philosophy and philosophy are not about ivory towers. I don't like philosophers who are in ivory towers. Philosophy has a civic task of changing our civilization, is of, of bringing thought to our civilization. When our societies, our human beings, as Hannah Arendt said, become thoughtless and they create uh, monstrosities like Nazism or uh, gulags, or Rwanda, or Darfur, or ISIS. This is the moment of intervention, philosophical intervention. But because it's the moment, it's a Socratic examination of our civilizations. But Socrates and philosophers did it in a nonviolent way. They, this is a nonviolent intervention. They did not do it with guns. They did it with their concepts and creativities as artists have been doing it all through. And that's why they stay in our hearts and in our minds. And we still you need them. We need to go back and look at Guern Picasso's Guernica. But we need to go back and listen to the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven. 
but we also need to go back and read uh, Hegel and uh, Schopenhauer and many others. Well, on that positive note, um, <laughs> thank you for being with us. Thank Mark. you.